Yeah, uh, look, it's coming. Uh, let's move mm. on. We want to talk a little bit of rugby. I'm delighted to so we got Johnny Murphy with us. Johnny, good morning to you. How are you getting on? Morning, guys. How's all with you? Yeah, yeah all good. Good. Um, you also are, are doing a run this weekend. What's the details of, of your run? Uh, yeah, we have a, um, a big rugby run. Um, we have about, uh, I mean, we've got about over 1,500 people uh, participating. Um, we've raised probably in around 17 grand. Um, and we're going to cover a distance of hopefully over five. 5,000 kilometers. So um, it's across uh, rugby league, rugby union, um, kids, uh, players. So there's three past, uh, uh, past player teams from Munster, one from Leinster, one from Connacht. Um, I have a team in it. So up front, it's all in aid of Feed the Heroes for uh, feeding frontline staff. Um, so I have uh, two Irish internationals, uh, female internationals, Linda. Uh, Dijon and uh, Claire Fitzpatrick. I also have um, uh, Billy Holland and Tom Gleeson, who have, well, Billy obviously with his story has kind of sampled exactly what the frontline staff workers do. And the other, all the other three are, are uh, fighting on the front line at the moment. So, um, yeah, it's a good cause. We've been obviously pretty quiet with the academy. So we decided to turn our attention to doing something like this. And it's, it's kind of taken off, which is great. How far are you running? Yeah, uh, I, I'm yeah, I'm running a ten point five k, right. the furthest I've uh, ever run. So I did eight k lat at the start of this week, and um, yeah, I've a newfound respect for anyone that consistently runs five k's or anything past that. It's it's a bit of a mental dredge. I'm carrying, still carrying a bit of extra timber, so that doesn't particularly help uh, when you get past five k. It's uh, it's hard on lockdown not to be carrying a little bit of extra timber. It turns out. <laughs> yeah, I would agree. Um, come here, obviously you were part of a coaching ticket um, that had delivered great success at schools level and we're looking forward to a historic schools cup final. Um, that's gone, is it totally gone or is a prospect of it happening next year? What, what is the actual scenario with that? Uh, it was kind of a, a wait and see uh, really, um, but I'd say you know, given everything that's going on, the likelihood is that it's it's um, it's it's done. So it's it's going to be shared. Um, but I think for the six years specifically, I think there's a whole lot of uncertainty around the more important part of their six year journey in terms of the the leaving cert. So it's just to try and get some clarity on that for them first, and then see where we sit. But it, it is more or less over, I would say, for us, unfortunately. Um, but look, there's bigger things at at, uh, at stake now in society. So we just have to, you know, I, I was big on the kind of, uh, you know, better people, uh, better players stuff throughout the season. So, um, you know, and the fact that rugby gives them tools to deal with stuff in real life, um, and they probably have to, you know, they have to, use those tools now to deal with everything that's going on in their lives. Are you still in contact with them? Are you talking to many of them about what is happening with the, the Leaving Cert and the level of anxiety they have about not knowing what the plan is? Uh, yeah, I'd be in constant. I'd be in good bit of contact with uh, Marcus Kiley. He'd be our captain, um, and you know he's pretty level-headed guy. Um, so he's fine, but there is a certain amount of anxiety across the board, and they just don't really know what 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 to do. Um, I've been lucky that my six-year group are would be a very intelligent group of young men, so they kind of get the responsibility attached to them, but they also. Um, like there's probably more guys going for academic scholarships in in uh, in college than there are for athletic scholarships. So um, the exams would be a big big part of. A lot of them want want to do it because they feel they can kind of like the mocks were in the middle of the cup campaign. So you know if they do go predictive things, probably not a lot of lads would have been in a good spot then. You know, um, so it's difficult. It really is difficult for them. But you know, hopefully there's a a resolution soon you know uh, there's talk of that over the last couple of days but I think they they certainly deserve that yeah no absolutely I think uh, anybody involved in education anybody knows anybody who's teaching leave inserts or is, has leave inserts in the house understands exactly the, the level of anxiety that it's causing because it's like the not knowing is almost worse than the knowing if they just make a decision and stick to it then everybody goes okay well that's the decision made but uh, mm -hmm. it is the and in, in many ways that kind of un, um, the, the lack of a plan exist in, in all aspects of, of sport that we're talking about. I know obviously you've got a very keen interest in racing and we're quite keen to see when that decision is going to be made and obviously people are working away in the background to try and get the government to come down exactly on one side or the other. Is this agriculture? Is it, uh, I mean, 100% is agriculture and so therefore they could not follow 
on the same path as all of the other sports are, but I don't know if you've got any thoughts on, on what's going to happen with that and how the industry is going to be impacted. Um, yeah, I think it's it's everything is just in a holding pattern, and and it's very difficult for people to plan. Um, you know, like we had a we've three horses in the syndicate. One was supposed is literally yesterday just went to a pre training yard on the on the hope that racing would be starting at the end of the month or in, in June. But we had to hold off on that because we don't really know where we're landing at the moment. Um, we unfortunately, two of the three were ready to run the first weekend. Uh, we didn't get there. Um, but I think there was a realization that that was the right thing to do to to cancel everything and and society needed it needed to happen. So, but now things, you know, I think I was listening to Anthony earlier on. There is going to be a certain. Um, you know, aspect of that we have to kind of live with this now. We have to a new normal, as everyone is is talking about. So it's to find best practice ways of of doing, you know, living your your daily your daily life, your your job, and you know, I think racing has done it before. So hopefully they get an opportunity to show that it it can be done sooner rather than later. But the, I suppose the difference in racing is that horses need to be ridden out every single day. And because everyone needs staff, they can't furlough the staff. So it's the equivalent, I'm not sure whether it's a good analogy, but it's the equivalent of telling, you know, the vintners that they need to bring in all their staff. They need to pull the exact same amount of points, but they can't sell any of them. Um, and that's the reality of of where the the, the training yards are, the breeders are, um, the breeze up guys. No one knows what's happening because the ra racing is kind of the showcase but it's only the the top layer there's a huge amount underneath that that goes to uh, it's a massive massive industry and and that's in a lot of worry at the moment i think any trainer under who has between 35 horses and down if it is going to be the 29th of june or, or early july is what what was people are are potentially thinking they're going to be under a lot of pressure and that's going to mean a loss of, of more jobs. Yeah, and, and that's where people begin to get very anxious about what's happening again. And like, I know, obviously, nothing can be done to jeopardise public health, but finding a way to live with the public health issues is kind of the next stage where all of our brain power needs to be focused. Now, in terms of the situation with regards to rugby, I don't know, uh, like, there's a very interesting piece today with Dana Falvey where he's talking about how he thinks that there might be rugby in New Zealand and, and Australia relatively soon. Um, we're going to see the, the rugby league back in, in Australia first and then very soon you'd expect to see rugby union back after that. So um, that's kind of green shoots of hope and certainly world rugby seem to be on top of exactly what the protocols would need to be to play. And he, he thinks that there will actually be uh, matches and potentially before spectators um, by the end of the year in Ireland. Certainly the interprovincials will be the ones that come back first. Um, the sport is in a fairly precarious situation, it seems, with regards to its finances, and it's certainly expanded very rapidly. So it's going to be interesting to see how well they they come through this, or or what rugby looks like on the on the far side of it. Uh, yeah, I think that's going to be uh, going to be the thing. We there's different reports that have come out. I've seen the um, New Zealand return to play protocols. Uh, there's one that's just been published actually from the Swiss Rugby Union. It's a five stage protocol. Um, so it's the New Zealand one is four stage. So it, it's it's going to be how we manage through and. I think everyone knows it's the close contact quarters that are are, are the issue in rugby, um, but I think there is a just a you know an acceptance that rugby behind closed doors or within what a, what the government guidelines are on gatherings, public gatherings, that's just the way it's going to be. Um, whether that means that the amateur game or the club game, the schools game can go back to some way normal because you know the crowds are are generally very small at at, uh, at the majority of games but it's an acceptance that professional sport is going to be behind closed doors for a longer period of time than people want and that's ultimately what provides the the money to to fund the whole game so it's very difficult for all the unions and world rugby to to plan financially when and now to be fair Ireland are in a they're in a better situation than a lot of people than a lot of other unions um you know I was speaking to my friends over in England 
English rugby is in a a very dangerous position. Um, you know, obviously the RFU came out with that uh, article yesterday in terms of the money that they're going to lose, which is astronomical. But the independent clubs are also on their knees as well. There's three or four clubs that are going to struggle to keep the doors open if they don't return to to playing. And, you know, people, Newcastle have furloughed every, nearly all their staff. You know, there was an article a couple of weeks ago, Dean Richards offered his services back to the police, given he was a police officer before he went into professional rugby. Um, and, you know, that's that's a problem. There's a huge amount of uncertainty for players as well. Their contracts are up at the end of the, within two months. Um, there was a big article last week about some clubs that players weren't agreeing to pay pay cuts they had no, um, they don't have contracts from the 1st of July. So, you know, they're taking a double hit and they don't know where they're going to end up. So there's just a a huge amount of uncertainty around everything. But I think people want to get back to rugby, want to get to, back to training and playing. We have to follow the guidelines. And I think sooner we have a, a general pathway, the better, so people can start planning. It can't be a case of, right, lads, you can do full contact, let's play in two weeks' time. There has to be a build-up to that. And there has to be a build up um, physically for your bodies to be able to uh, deal with the physical demands of the game. Um, in Ireland, it'd be great if there's um, you know, a filter down to the club game. Um, in the AIL, if travel's not allowed, the Interpros can go ahead and you know, having guys back in the clubs. I know Brendan Fanning did a piece a couple of weeks ago that was excellent on it. And you know, he's a big advocate of the club game. I'm obviously a bit biased because my journey into professional rugby was through the club game. So it'd be great to see that if it was an opportunity. Um, but it looks really like the only pathway, unless you run an extended interprovincial where it's home and away and they try and get six, seven, eight, ten games maybe out of it with semi final and finals. So I, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, that would, like, it, <laughs> it sounds. Like the type of thing a couple of years ago, you'd be like, really, we're going to play that off and the whole country is going to watch. But, you know, you can see now if, it, if November and December is interprovincials and then everybody qualifies for semifinals. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, uh, we, we might take that. We, we're, <laughs> we're laughing now, but like come November, December, like, yeah, so the fifth time this week we're seeing Leinster versus Munster. <laughs> Happy days. But it's something to watch, I suppose, rather than all the reruns that are going around, which is probably the most important thing. Yeah, for sure. Johnny, uh, best of luck with the run this weekend. If anybody wants to donate, how do they get to it? Uh, we have a GoFundMe page and different clubs have different GoFundMe pages. So um, if you go on our GoFundMe page, just go to uh, WWF, the Big Rugby Run, and you'll be able to follow all. There's still a few places left, so hopefully we can get to maybe 2,000 people running and try and get as close to over and past 20K for Feed the Heroes. It'd be brilliant. That'd be great. Thanks a million. Uh, the Big Rugby Run, Johnny Murphy there giving us details of that. We wish him and everybody else doing that run the best of luck this weekend. Now, a reminder, we release up to 40 podcasts per week across the OTB Podcast Network. Some uh, examples from this week. Joe Cole, the actor on our OTB Culture Hall of Fame. Kevin Caban and Leon Osman looking back at Everton's ill-fated Champions League campaign. All Blacks legend Sean Fitzpatrick joined Keith Wood on Wednesday Night Rugby. There's all 14 episodes of the Classic Game Club. Off the Bull, it's our podcast that looks back at each and every episode of The Last Dance, the Michael Jordan documentary. Louds, Sporting Mount Rushmore with Ronan Mullen and uh, Dan McDonald was the most recent one. And then tomorrow morning, Tipperary's turn, Alan Quinlan and Michael Quinlevin are going to be doing the uh, carving. Subscribe to highlights from OTB uh, for all of that.